here this morning. Um, we're going we're gonna to kind of embark on a, a journey here together. And I need, if you're, if you're planning on being in attendance in the next several weeks, I need you to focus in hard. If you're just passing through town today, I, I don't want to apologize for this, but I'm going to give a ton of scripture today. And, and I'm not going to get to show exactly where we're going with all of it, okay? So forgive me for that if it, if it doesn't uh, explain itself. I, I, I think you'll get some great things today. Anytime you're in God's Word, you'll get some great things. But it's going to make a lot more sense in the weeks to come. Um, one of the things that uh, I kind of am liking this message to is the, the artist palette, okay? Anybody in here do painting? Anybody like to, to paint? Anybody? Nobody? Okay, okay, bashful people. Okay, there's a painter. Uh, uh, I, 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 don't do, I, I don't do painting. I, I have done painting. I did some painting in school and entered a state competition. And so I, 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 if you've ever really painted, uh, and I don't mean like, like watercolors. Well, actually, you can get pretty serious with watercolors as far as mixing them goes. But a lot of the acrylic paint is what I'm talking about, where you start mixing and making your own colors. You go to the store. If you're, if you're, if you're used to markers... Okay, markers, you need a big old box to get all the colors, right? If you want to really spice up a picture with multiple colors, you got to really kind of get a, one of those monster Crayola boxes, right? But when you're actually doing acrylic pain, painting, you, you, you don't need as many primary colors. But what happens is, is it starts out like this. You just kind of, <laughs> you, put your, you put your paint on the artist's palette. But then this is kind of what it looks like later as things go forward. It, it kind of becomes this, right? Because you start mixing and coming up with little less blue, little. Anybody remember? Is it Bob Ross? Right? How many of you are thinking of Bob Ross already? Like you can't even help it. I almost someone in our church ha has a Bob Ross T-shirt. I was trying to remember who it was. I thought about wearing it today. Look at a little pretty bird right here. And uh, but Bob Ross, okay, uh, this is not the whole message. But here's what we're going to do today. Just so you know. We're walking towards a study. Our next series, if God doesn't change things, is. Um, Hello, My Name is God. If you were here for Hello, My Name is Jesus series that we did, um, Jesus, by the way, who was uh, made flesh and dwelt among us, um, is the easiest one of the Trinity for us to understand because Jesus was made flesh and spoke our language, not our language as Americans, but our, with a, a tongue like we do as human beings. He was the example of God in man form, right? And so... And yet, when we really went to the Bible and said, Lord, we want to know Jesus as he is, as he is in heaven, not as we have made him out to be in the church, not as we have heard through the flannel graph stories of Sunday school years ago, but who is Jesus really? And we did a whole study on that. And many great Christians in this church that I, I esteem as great Christians walked away going, wow. I, and not because of the preaching, but because of Jesus. Funny thing happens when you put all of your focus on Christ and ask him to show you himself Sometimes he just shows off a little bit. Sometimes he shows you who he really is. And, and folks, we have a very powerful Jesus. We have a Jesus that doesn't just save eternal souls from hell to heaven, but we have a Jesus that wants to save marriages. We have a Jesus that wants to save finances. We have a Jesus, the gospel of Jesus wants to come into your world and save it. Can we do something very important for the next uh, study? I need us to take the word salvation and I need us to think about it for just a minute okay because when when we say anybody ever do door-to-door -door confrontational evangelism anybody ever done that in your lifetime wave at me if you've done it okay I've done a ton of it let me tell you how it works you knock on a door and whoever answers the door you talk to them about Jesus it's a it's it's a it's a very interesting way to to be a witness it's a good way to be a witness it's not the only way to be a witness. In fact, of all the ways to be a witness, it's kind of the laziest way to be a witness. Although it's really hard to get out there. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter how much I love people. I can just show up on their porch as a salesman, so to speak, knock on a door and say, hey, let me ask you some really hard questions about life and make you uncomfortable on your porch. And if you'll go all the way with me, I'll tell you about Jesus. I'm just going to let that land. Because some of you are like, He's not supposed to say that. No, it's good. It's good. However, most of you are walking out life in a community with people who are dying and going to hell. 
and what I have experienced is most of us won't witness to them because they know who we really are. So it's a little easier to just go knock on a stranger's door and make them uncomfortable rather than make ourselves uncomfortable. I'm going to let that land for just a second. Because if I'm not careful, I'll get some evil eyes throwing the message at me. And I'm just going to let you get an evil eye from heaven first. (laughs) There's some truth in that. Let me, uh, by the way, if you think I'm here to do away with confrontational door-to-door evangelism, you are completely wrong and you don't know me. I'm not doing away with it. I'm calling you to at least both. And that is this, that you start understanding what Christ has called you to completely. In the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6.10, if you'll put that on the screen, Matthew 6.10 says this, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you recognize this verse from the Lord's Prayer? Okay. On earth as it is in heaven. This is where the church has really gotten off track. What we actually say on earth as it is in church. And so what's happened is we've sat in pews like this for a long time. We, here's a dirty little secret about Christianity. We don't read this. We pay someone to read it for us and to unpack it to us 52 times a year if we don't miss church. And then when they unpack it, they usually do a good job. They usually do something funny. They do something tear-jerking. They do something fanciful. They do something that is is eloquent. And we go, they must know what they're talking about. Because number one, they've been hired. Number two, they've been given a platform. And number three, they're a man of God. And four... They did a really good job. So whatever they say, it's more than I know about the Word of God. So therefore, ergo, it must be true. On earth, as it is in the church. And God has done a, 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 if you've been been hanging with us for the last year, I just spent a week with my dear friend, Doug Fisher, a dear friend of mine, I spent, uh, not a whole week, but about four days sitting in a coffee shop with him, drinking Hebrews Hawaiian hazelnut coffee until literally all we did was call time out from Bible study to go to the bathroom and get more coffee. That's just, that's just what we did for four days. It was great. And uh, uh, one of the things I was trying to explain to him, and I, I, I haven't even tried to really explain it to this church, is all that God is doing in my life this year with the sabbatical, with all the things that I've, I've been through and what God seems to be showing off a little bit. I'm going to tell you one little brief one. So I told the church several weeks back that I was praying about this Hello, My Name is God series, right? And if, if you were here then, you remember me saying, I'm really kind of struggling on how to get, how to get on to that on-ramp. You're not going to believe how God met me in that. So I was... I was thinking some things through, talking some things through with Pastor Fisher, talking some things through with some other friends that I have, and, and, and not in this place. I was just kind of keeping it to myself on what God's doing in my life. And, and then I was meeting with the bank for the building. And our banker, um, his name's Scott, he, 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 he's a believer and started asking me some questions. You know, we finished, we were at lunch and we, we were at Bruce's and we finished the talk about what we met to talk about, the finances, and, and he said, he said, you know, where you at on this? And he starts talking about some things. I said, man, it's crazy. I, I'm literally, like, you just brought up a topic that I'm, like, right in the middle of. He said, oh. He said, have you heard this? And have you heard this? And have, he said, uh, I wrote a book. So I'm going to actually give all of you at the end of this study a book that our banker wrote pretty incredible 
when you start praying for something, and I can't tell you what a confirmation that was for other decisions we were trying to make, but the bottom line is when you start praying for something, God just does it in, in supernatural ways. And so um, God wants our church to go through this journey. God wants us to be stretched out a little bit. I know that I'm already stretching some of you out in my opening statements, and that's, that's what you do before you do a workout. You stretch out. And if you stretch out and you don't get to that point where there's a little bit of a, a, a tension, you didn't stretch out right, right? I'm ready. You're going to pull something. <laughs> so I was trying to stretch you out a little bit more, okay? And, and here's what we want. I don't want, I, I, I'm beyond not wanting. It's not working. On earth as it is in church, it isn't working. Trying to get McDowell County to act like church people is, is it's a failed process, and it's not going to radically, dynamically change their lives. So I'm over that. I'm, I'm, I'm completely over that. God has released me from that. I have freedom in Christ in that. I don't mean to be offensive when I say that. If you're offended by that, I am so sorry that you're offended by that. Uh, I wish you could just walk all the way through what this year and the past couple years have been at this church and what God's doing and what God apparently isn't scared of because the, the blessings that he's giving are supernatural. I know it's easy when you look at something from outside, oh, that must be. No, there's some supernatural things going on at this church, and I praise God for it. It is so not our preacher. It is so not a big name. I promise you that. It, it's, it's kind of a joke what's going on up here, but God is good. Amen? And so I, I wanna, we're going to talk about on earth as it is in heaven, and I want you to understand some things about rewards rewards that might seem like a random jump off of this verse but I I want you to understand something there's a day coming called the judgment seat of Christ that every one of us is gonna stand before Jesus as judge and his flaming eyes of fire that we read about in Revelation in our last study are going to try our works and I want to take some time and just start unpacking a whole lot of scripture. So imagine your painter's palette, and I'm just going to, I'm going to put all the stuff. And then what we're going to do is we're going to ask Jesus to start mixing that so that we can allow him to paint for us a picture as it is in heaven so that we at church can understand it here on earth as it is in heaven. In the process of that, I'm going to give you a warning. This is a Surgeon General's warning at the bottom of the carton of this message, okay? This could cause cancer. Cancer that will make you think you've got to find another church and leave. And I, I want you to know, you don't have to do that. You can just trust Jesus with it. If I am wrong about anything that I'm going to say in the oncoming weeks, I promise you heaven is okay with it. And I am not your priest. Which means if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It doesn't shake our vision. It doesn't shake our journey. It's just another area in Bob's life that God's going to keep working on. Are we okay with that? Are y'all okay with a preacher that might be wrong every once in a while? See, here's what I struggle with. A lot of people are okay with the, not okay with a preacher that's wrong, but they're pretty sure Jesus is often wrong. And I'd like to just switch places with Jesus because as, I, as far as I've figured this out, he will have no other gods before him. And if you put me on that pedestal, he will get rid of me because I will be in the way. And so I would just like to be the guy with the problems standing next to a God that has none. And we could trust him at his word. And so I'm going to give you a whole lot of his word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you where I think it's taking this church. And, and I reserve the right to adapt that as we go, as God continues to illuminate. But I promise you, I'm not shooting from the hip right now. I have been in this for over a year, studying hard, trying to understand something very, very important. And I believe God's beginning to show it to me in a way that's not just personal, but is in a way I can start to unpack for our church. And I also believe this church, it is crucially important for our vision, for what God is doing and what he's calling us to do in McDowell County, this is something we have got to collectively as a church understand. It is not enough that I understand it and I unpack it with my staff. I need the church to understand this. 
because it's going to take the church to do what God wants done in McDowell County. So this is not just another series to get us through the 52 weeks of a year. This is crucial to the life of our church, and that's why I want to take this much time at the beginning of the message to say, tune in. Now let's jump in. I'm going to give you a bunch of scripture. Remember, we're just kind of putting some things out on the pallet. Second John, verse number 8. It's a very short chapter. There's only one chapter in Second John. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. There's some heavy words there. Okay? By the way, do you work for your salvation? Salvation's a gift. I, need, I, I wanted to do this. I want to make sure I do this. I want to I help you with the word salvation. If you've done the door-to-door evangelism, I remember knocking on the door, and I, I, when I was first learning, I said, hello, do you know for sure if you're saved? And, and a little boy looked at me, and he said, yeah, yeah, I was in a swimming pool when I was young, and my dad saved me. And all the church goes, oh, I said, thank you. That's what the word saved me. See, what we've done is we've taken saved and salvation a word that the Bible uses, and we've made it mean only one thing from, heaven to he- from hell to heaven is salvation. And the truth is, God is in the saving business way more than just eternal security. And because he's a big God that knows how to use words as they're meant, he's going to use a word throughout Scripture, and you, it's our job to understand the context. That boy wasn't wrong. His dad did save him in a swimming pool. I believe that, and that is the definition of saved. It's just not what I was talking about. I wanted to know if he was on his way to heaven or hell, and I wanted to see that direction change if it was hell. I wanted him to ask Jesus Christ into his heart. But how many of you know when a marriage comes to my office and says, we need help, Pastor, our marriage is falling apart, I can't just say, bow your head and close your eyes and pray this prayer. Jesus, please come in our hearts. You're both saved now. You should be fine. It's not how it works. Because Christian marriages are ready to kill each other, maybe at a faster rate than the world's marriages, because the, Satan is after the Christian marriage. He is absolutely out to destroy the Christian marriage. I am 100% convinced that Satan is doing everything he can to keep homosexual marriages together. I believe that. You could, you could say you're wrong. That's fine. I told you I'm okay with being wrong this whole series. I'm good with it. Uh, but I, I really believe he is for shacking up. He's for it. He's for it, man. I mean, if you just want to live together. Now, God, the hounds of heaven will be after you. They're pretty effective, too, if you're God's child. If you're not God's child, quit looking at Hollywood and getting frustrated. If they're not God's child, God is not after them. The hounds of heaven aren't after them. And Satan is great with it. Anybody seen Elton John and his buddy? been together for how many years now in a happy marriage well thanks satan i'm not thanking god for that god doesn't have any i told you i was gonna some of you didn't stretch enough let's get let's get down there Ah, some of you need to stretch a little bit more okay sorry watch yourselves watch yourselves quit looking at hollywood quit looking at everybody around you quit looking at mcdowell county watch yourself because you're in danger of something according to this verse so that you may not lose what we have worked for you did not work for your salvation you cannot lose your salvation that is not what this is talking about but there is something that you should have been working for that you can absolutely lose according to second john 1 8 but may win a full reward a full reward. I believe there's a difference between reward and full reward. I believe there's a difference between being in Christ and abiding in Christ. I believe there's a difference between life and abundant life when you study Scripture. I believe that there's a difference in being in dealt with the, indwelt with the Spirit or filled with the Spirit. Those are different things in Scripture. I believe there's a difference in going to heaven and having an abundant entrance into heaven. There's a difference. I'm going to say something real strong right now, but you're going to see it in some verses in a minute. There's going to be some people that get to heaven and taste death for the first time. I'm going to show it to you from the Bible. We think heaven is just a bunch of naked babies popping cherries in our mouths and and fanning us with palms. You've been looking at cards at Hallmark too long. This is not what heaven is. Some are going to suffer loss in heaven. I'm going to show you from Scripture. Do I have your attention now? Because I need your attention now. Because as your pastor, I am responsible before heaven to your understanding of the judgment seat of Christ. And it's not popular preaching. 
I don't expect the church to grow during this series. It might shrink. But it's an important message. Revelation 3, chapter 10, verse 12 says, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. There's a trial coming, a judgment coming on the entire earth. And he says, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have. Let's let's keep going. Verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have. He says it again. So that no one may seize your crown. Verse 12. The one who conquers... I, everybody remember this passage in Revelation? We're reading about the churches of Revelation here. This is, this is just right out of the study we just did. And here's what he says. The one who conquers, he's talking to one of the seven churches here. I will make him a pillar in the temple. It's not a pillar. I got, like a pillow? That's not what it is. I got to help my Nebo people. I like a pillar from Jesus. I got one in my pillars and it's not doing real good. This is not that, okay? The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar Like something that helps to hold the structure together. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. Uh, This is why it's an on-ramp. We're going to find more about this God that's clearly building a temple that we don't know about or we don't study about, that we think is located in a faraway land here on earth, but there's another temple being built by God, and and, and he wants us to be a part of it. He wants us to be part of the structure, part of the infrastructure of who that is. And you don't get to become a part of the infrastructure by praying a prayer to get saved. Asking Jesus to save you. There's more that we need to understand from the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. The next verse. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath or a perishable crown. The reason I like the ESV is this is, this is actually Olympic language. The Olympics actually existed when this was written. And he's using the Olympics, the wreath that the Olympians used to wear. If you've seen old pictures, they would actually receive an Olympic crown. Okay? It was a wreath. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable. So I do not run, verse 26, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. So there's some Olympic conversation going on here. There's the runner in a marathon. There's a boxer now. And and, and this is, this is, this is, I'm not as one that's beating the air. Shadow boxing. Everybody know what shadow boxing is? It's when you're fighting and no one's there. By the way, you always win that one. Right? Even when you dodge a a, a jab, you're the one that invented the jab coming from that direction. Do you understand that? Anybody ever been shadow boxing in a Christian life said, whoa, almost got me, devil, and you made up the thing you just dodged? (laughs) And you think you beat the devil, you're like, yeah, yeah. No, you made that up. You, 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 you thought it in your own mind, and, and victory over your besetting sins was your choice to make in the first place. See, Satan's going to get you when it's not your choice. When all of a sudden you're like, hey, everything. Like, Where'd that come from? Satan's got left hooks, jabs, uppercuts you don't even know about. So, so, so I do not run aimlessly. <laughs> Where are you going? I don't know, <laughs> but I hope I win. That's kind of how the Christian life is going for some people. There is not an expected end. There is not a reward that we've fixed our eyes on that we're pursuing. We're just kind of doing church together. Hey, how y'all doing? Ooh, you're mean to me. I'm going to go, hey, can I be in this group? Oh, this feels nice. This feels right until it doesn't. See ya. And, and we're just kind of running aimlessly through the Christian. Have you done this study? It's great. Oh, I don't, I don't, you got that out of it? No, that's way too deep for me. I like this study over here. And we're just all over the place. We're, we're winning at all of the games we're making up. Somebody told you 
perfect church attendance gets a gold star, and now you're a good Christian because you haven't missed church since you can remember. And that's no different than the boy that made his own ruler and told his mom, Mom, I'm seven foot tall. It's great. I'm going to play in the NBA. Son, you're six. Yeah, but no, I'm seven foot tall. Look, I made a ruler. This is what the church has done. On earth, as in the church, and we've made this little list of goals that are super duper attainable, and we've patted each other on the back for it. And, and worse, we've shamed other people in the community that didn't measure up to what we made. And now we're living in a post-Christian community that says, hang it, I think you made it up anyway. And they're right. The problem is we don't know it because we don't know it. Someone told us you get a gold star for attending church. And we've been attending church like animatons ever since because we're good Christians. So, hey, I want you back next week. But if you need to miss church next week so God can stretch out the fact that you're not as good a Christian as you are, it'd be the best week you ever spent not coming to church. Because while you're not at church next week, I hope you learn this. God loves you. And he's so crazy about you, he could care less about you running to obtain a prize he didn't invent. Now, let me really mess y'all up. Y'all ready? Jesus didn't even go to church every Sunday. <clears throat> he didn't. Study your Bible. Like one time he talked about going to the temple, it was the annual trip. What? <laughs> yeah, okay. So all y'all are like, see you next year, Bob. Okay, that's your choice. We'll be fine. You might not. You don't need to apologize to Bob and the church for not being here. But you might need to be here so we can encourage you towards a coming reward. And I'd like for you to rethink the reason you go to church while we're in this study. Verse 27. But I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Does anybody here think that, that Paul was saying, lose my salvation? Disqualified. There's only one qualifier to get to heaven, right? That's what the whole church is here for. So Paul's worried about losing his salvation? No. He's worried about losing pillar status. He's worried about not having the positional authority that God has an expected end for him in the millennial reign and in the kingdom to come. And Paul says, I don't want to lose that. When you get your eyes on heaven and you understand God for who he really is and you start living for something better than your 401k and the house on the lake and this, the new uh, cabin and all the things that you're planning on this earth, when you get that straight, nothing wrong with all of those things. I'm totally fine with all those things. I promise you I am. I think heaven is. In fact, I think God wants those type of blessings on his children. But... I say this very carefully because the way it sounds, it's a big but. <laughs> Not at the expense of eternity. Paul's like, I am not going to mortgage the future, so I'm going to discipline myself now to, to fix my eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth are going to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I have got to get the bigger picture of who God is. And so do you. Because this community needs some imagers. Some imagers that were created in the image of God, but have never stopped looking at the image of God. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I'm going to go quicker here so you just keep up with the screen. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. 
Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. I hit this this summer, and my brain exploded. I, I, do you remember me telling you a little bit, like one of the rumors about John was he was going to live forever? Remember us talking about that? Because, because Jesus said something like this to John, and everybody thought, oh, John's the favorite. He's going to live forever. He's gonna... Listen to what he's saying. He wasn't speaking of John. He's talking about tasting death. Do you understand something as a child of God? You don't taste death. It's a shadow. You ever tasted a shadow? There's one right here. You want to come taste it? <laughs> you can't taste shadows. You, you, the reason Christians don't taste death is because the Bible says we sleep. The Bible says Jesus took the sting of death. Oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Many of us Christians are never, even in our death, going to taste death. But some of us standing here are going to taste death for the first time when we see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Because to lose rewards has the taste of death to it. Let me keep reading. So, Luke chapter 12, verse 20. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? This is the guy that had so much stuff. He said, man, I've got so much stuff. I've got so many barns. I'm going to have to tear down my barns and build bigger barns to hold all my stuff. Anybody else in, in, in McDowell County amazed with the self-storage? miracle going on in our county like we have a housing crisis but we have so much self-storage units for the junk that we all have i guess i don't know i don't own one i guess we go visit it do you go visit your stuff i don't know what's like hey guys see you next month i don't know how it works but we've got so much stuff that we can't build these self-storage things fast enough. I need some more men in the church to start building them and start making revenue off of that and then tithing. Amen. I, it's, it's a miracle what's going on. Go up to Asheville. Everywhere you go in Asheville, there are these huge four- and five-story buildings of storage units going up. You know why? Because America has the same idea of success that this guy had. It, the, the, the country that was founded on Judeo-Christian values is so materialistic that we need miniature houses to, to, to hold all our stuff because we get our identity from our success and our stuff. You want to really wad someone up? Take their stuff away from them. They don't know who they are. They don't know what to do. I want my stuff. I want it, I want it now. I got to have my stuff. I got my stuff. I got all neat. Look at my stuff. Is my stuff nice? My stuff's nicer than your stuff. You like my stuff? I might sell you my stuff one day. What do you have? I might want some of your stuff. But borrow sites, selling sites. The only reason you would ever part with your stuff is to get enough money to go get some more stuff. You would never get rid of stuff to lay up treasures in heaven. You can't see that stuff. At least you can go visit your storage shed and see your stuff. And God said, Fool! Let me say that again. God said, so you don't know it, was, it wasn't me, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be then? Verse 21. So is the one, so is the one. So look, that's a great message and fun to preach because people get mad if you like getting people mad. I actually don't like that. But if you can understand that feeling you felt, that's the feeling you should have about the next verses because so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The anxiety you felt when I said all those things in the last verse should be the anxiety that the church feels about heaven one day with no rewards. But we have no anxiety there. Paul did. Paul said, I bring my body under subjection, lest I myself be a castaway. Cast away from what, Paul? From being a pillar in the next life. I am laying up my treasures in heaven. And that's why he said, I can glory in my infirmities. Because you know what? It's not about this life. It's about the next life. A little pain for a little while, I'll be fine. What a heaven's view. 
But the church is not anxious about the next life. We're ticked at the preacher over what he said about the storage sheds. He knew I just got one this month. No, I didn't. I didn't know. Sorry. I got people in the church that sell storage units. I'm in trouble right now, okay? So it's good. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We okay? A lot of scripture here. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It's coming. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. God's not just in heaven with stickers. Good job, good job, good job, good job. He's in heaven going, hmm. Didn't we read some of this in Revelation? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. Well, I just like to think of Jesus as like this real loving God that doesn't, that, that's just an encourager. He just says, good church, Go. Sometimes he says, bad church, no! Oh, well, we don't preach that. Nobody likes that message, Bob. If you keep preaching a message like that, if we don't preach a message like that, we have nothing to offer this community because we're living for ourselves. Romans 14, 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? This is a great question. Why are you so worried about the other churches are doing don't you know they're going to be at the judgment seat too? Preacher, did you hear what they said about us? Quit worrying about it. I'm worried about what he said about us. It doesn't matter. Well, preacher, I mean, they won't stop. It's incessant. They talk about it at work. They talk about the water cooler. I got, they gave me one of their preacher's messages. I listened to his whole CD. I think the whole thing was about us. I don't care. And the fact that you care tells me as a pastor, I'm not doing my job. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or you? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. We've got enough to worry about right here. Quit worrying about the other church. Quit worrying about the other Christians. Quit worrying about Hollywood. Quit worrying about the, the world and the, the Democrats and the Republicans and the Libertarians and the Progressives and the Socialists. And, oh, I'm so worried about... Stop! Have you thought about your problem lately? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. Let me show this to you. I've got to show this to you so fast. It's so unfair what I do to myself. I, give it, I get so much content. There's no way to get it all out. 1 Corinthians 3, 8. I know you feel like it's unfair to you. It's about me, okay? 1 Corinthians 3, 8 says this. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. You say, preacher, you talked about the building last week. Yes, but I'm talking about the building this week. The building that's so expensive that Jesus bought it with his blood Millions be damned. Jesus paid for you with his blood. You're the pearl of great price. You're the building that has no other maker than God. Quit worrying about the building and worry about the building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one of you take care how he builds upon it. For no one, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, or straw, verse 13, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, the day, the day is the judgment day. The day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort, S-O-R-T, not what size, S-I-Z-E, what sort it is. God is so less concerned with the number of people in this room as he is concerned with the type of people in this room. What sort are you? 
what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. So we're talking about rewards. How do you receive a reward? Not by doing works, by doing surviving fire work. There's a lot of works that aren't going to survive the fire. You don't get rewards for w- works that get consumed. Just so you know, the bad works get consumed. And by the way, that's part of your salvation. Jesus paid for your bad works. They're consumed. Can someone say amen? Amen. but his eyes of fire will also consume some of our good works. Because we thought going to church meant we were a good Christian. He's going to go, I'm not counting one of those days because you went for you. You went for your arrogance. You went for your position in the community. You went so someone else would look up to you. You went so the preacher would be proud. You went because it became a way of life for you to ignore all the things you should have been working on, but you're a good church person. And guess what? It's gone. Now what you got? Uh, God, I was kind of banking on all those years of church attendance as being something. And he's like, nothing else? Move along. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. If you think God looking at you and saying, is that all? move along doesn't feel like death wait till you see him face to face it probably doesn't feel like death right now because it's a Jesus you really don't know but when Jesus looks at you and says yeah none of that counted thanks but no thanks those steps away are going to gong with the sound of a death knell you will never get over in eternity until Jesus says okay we're done with that and it's a big deal Can I show you a picture? I got to show this to you. So Jesus is the foundation, right? This is this is the church. Uh, feed me feed me these in order because I don't remember how we laid it out. The church, God's heavenly elect. That's you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to explain what that means here in just a second. And then he says, all of us are building on this foundation. We're building the building, the the, the building of your life, not the building that we're purchasing and buying and trying to do ministry in. The building of your life. Or you're building that building, and there's several. There's a bunch of people all building. There's no other foundation. So if you're a child of God, all of us are building on the foundation that is Jesus Christ. And there's some building materials. There's gold, silver, precious stones, and then there's a whole other category of building materials that are wood, hay, and stubble. Which survives the fire? Gold, silver, precious stones. The fire makes the gold more valuable right? Fire does not make wood more valuable. Hay, not so much. Hey, hey, where'd it go? <laughs> it's gone. Stubble, I mean, just, just junk in a pile. Uh, that's the stuff that's, that's down there like at the end of a fire that's worth less. It's worth nothing. So God says, I will not approve of wood, hay, stubble. Only what's gold, silver, and precious stones will survive the fire of my judgment. Later in 1 Corinthians, he gives another example that we're going to put up next to this, but let's go look at the scripture first. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5, almost done. For I do not want you to be unaware. One of the problems with the church is we are living life completely unaware. Unfocused, unaware, unlaser beam focused on the future. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers that our fathers were all under the cloud. He's giving an example of what he's been talking about in 1 Corinthians. All, our fathers were under the cloud. Under the cloud, what's he talking about? He's not talking about the eye cloud. Okay? The fathers, uh, their fathers, the Israelites' fathers left Israel, and what led them? The will of God led them by the cloud, right? All the fathers of Israel were under that cloud. Let's, let's, I want mean, the key word here is all. All under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, here it is, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. funny thing happened when God made me the pastor of this church I asked him for it but I didn't see it coming you ever pray for something you didn't see coming I argued with him for three months because I'm a youth pastor I'm a knucklehead I I just like to have fun senior pastors walk different they talk with a steeple in their throat They're, they're, they're very educated they don't know how to have fun you can't get it out of them with a crowbar this was all my opinions it's not true it's just what I thought okay So I argued with God. And the argument finally went like this. God, I'll do it, but I want to be who you made me to be. I don't want to become a a play actor in a role. I don't want to do that. Is it okay if I don't do that? And God was like, yeah, I'd kind of prefer that, actually. And then I said, here's the other problem I have. I don't like adults. I'm going to shoot you straight. Adults are arrogant, self-righteous, overgrown with their own money teenagers. And here's the real thing, and I don't think Dan will amen this one. It gets worse as they get older. So God, if I'm going to pastor church, put a love for them inside of me that loves like I love the teenagers with because I don't know what happened when I was a teenager for 10 years but I lost my life for some of those kids when I read a verse like that with the love for you that God put in me that wasn't natural it was supernatural love that I have towards the people that call this church home So he gives this example of the Old Testament. These are, this is Israel, God's earthly elect. And, and all these Israelites are there, and then God says most of them were overthrown. By the way, they did not stop being God's earthly elect. They did not lose Israelite status. They just were unprofitable to God. You do not lose heaven. This is not a sermon series that should shake your eternal security, but it should most definitely shake you. I don't need anybody in this series getting nervous about their salvation because that is a gift from God. Works are something we do or don't. And I must have said something to Siri because she found something on the web. I apologize. Um, does this make sense? I hope it does. I want you to know that Jesus saw a difference between salvation and rewards. I'm going to end it right here. But I just need to say all of these verses that I've dumped on you, all of these, all of these colors that we've put on the palette, God is going to do something beautiful for those of us that will trust him with his word and walk into it. And here's what I believe he wants to do. He wants to show us how it ought to be on earth and how it is in heaven. And if we'll trust him in this process, we do not have to get nervous as a church. We do not have to get judgy of any other church. We do not have to get condemning of ourselves. We don't have to shoulda, woulda, coulda because we have a God that will give you back the years the locusts have eaten. You can get busy right now for the kingdom's sake and you can lay up something in heaven. And I'm calling this church to it and McDowell County is our playground.
we are going to do something for God of eternal, do something for God of eternal significance. Let me end on one, one verse, one more, because I'm skipping a bunch. Luke chapter 14, the very last one, verse 12. Listen to this advice God gives. You say, man, how do you, how do, you do a good work and it, and it survive the fire, preacher? This is awesome. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. Next verse. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. The way you get in he- crowns in heaven is not having a banquet. The point of this is motives matter. If you could take everything you've ever done in your life and honestly, honestly, painfully, honestly write down why you did it. If it could have been repaid in this life as to why you did it, or maybe if it was repaid in this life as to why you did it, I wouldn't bank on that surviving the hell fire that comes out of Jesus' eyes. I said this, I was trying to explain to some friends what's going on in my soul. And there's some of you in this room meaning very well you would come up to me afterwards and go, Bob, that's not true. No, you... But please don't do that. I did an honest accounting of my life as best I know how. And I had nothing before I came to me. nothing it was about me it was for me as a little kid I I, I was given a dream to grow up and be a great preacher To, 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 to get to get out there to work hard build a youth group Build a name. I got the reward. Big youth group. Yesterday I walked into Starbucks. A girl I'd never seen before. She wrote my name on the cup. me? Here's her reply. I can't believe it. Oh, everybody knows you. What's that do for them? What good is that? When God says, I don't know you. Slot over in heaven. Not to hell. Not to hell. I'll show it to you through the study. It's not hell. People have tried to make it hell. It's not hell. But boy, it feels like it. Many standing here in this place will not taste death until we see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom to judge us of our works. And then, what is that taste? That's death. You're saved yet, so as by fire, but taste it. I am not giving you anything that's not in the Bible, and I have not begun to unpack it yet. You've got to come back next week. Father, Lord, we love you. God, it is not my hope or my desire to threaten anybody, to give guilt complexes, to give shame to anyone. God, here's the most miraculous part of my sabbatical. When I got done with the accounting and I had very very few things only since I've been here in Nebo 
that I believe would survive the fire of God's judgment. I was so destroyed. I was so to the end of myself. I didn't, I didn't think I could get out of the bed. And it's in that moment showed me how much you love me. You showed me how much you want me to be your friend. You want me to be a pillar in your temple, not for my sake, but for your sake. And God, I'm not anyone special because you're no respecter of persons. If every person in this room would take the time to take the journey with you, they would run to the same conclusions that so much has been wasted on self, and yet you're not mad at them. You love them. And you're ready to come alongside them and do an eternal work together in the yoke. Lord, we love you. We praise you. I pray that this church would pony up for the, for the task ahead. In your name.